Hello and welcome to Micro Live. Tonight we'll be giving you some of the reactions to last week's story on electronic snooping. There's a second part of our look at micros for small businesses. And we discover why finding your way around a computer is just as confusing as getting lost in a barbecue. Last week, we showed you just how easy it is to snoop on the information on computer screens using equipment costing as little as £80. What have you done to it? All I've done is disconnect the synchronising circuit inside, build a synchronising, external synchronising box from components you can buy in any high street shop. Yes. And what Cost you, of that? Oh, about three or four pounds, somewhere in there. What you end up with? Right, now we're tuning in at the moment to an apricot micro over there. And yes, I can certainly see the word apricot as it drifts across. And that's, that is amazing reception. We've had many reactions to that story. In particular, several large banks and a major oil company phoned us up, worried about the security of data held on their computers. And a police headquarters in the north of England were also on the telephone, asking how they could protect themselves against computer spies. They were all completely ignorant of the threat before they saw our program. We can reveal that yesterday the Department of Trade and Industry held a meeting with British Telecom to discuss how to enforce stringent controls on emissions from computers. An official who was present at this meeting told us that the high level of radiation from apricot machines in particular was well known. The standard which is already known to MicroLive will be published in January and comes into force as a result of an amendment to the existing Wireless and Telegraphy Act. This amendment would give the government new powers to take computer manufacturers to court immediately should they fail to comply with the new standard. That means that the computer manufacturers will be forced to make expensive modifications to their machines when the law is amended. Yesterday's meeting concluded that it would take two and a half years to introduce the legislation, so the problem will still be with us for some time. Last week we examined the introduction of micros into small businesses and we gave you some straightforward advice. But what happens if the micro doesn't work out or your needs are more specialised? Hello. Hello, I've come to vaccinate the horse today. What's his name? Hugo. Hugo. Hugh Hugo. John Drew is a vet. He has a small practice dealing mainly with domestic pets and some larger animals. Choosing a system to meet his somewhat unusual needs wasn't easy, but at least he had some previous experience of computers. We started with a, a small Commodore 64 for just account purposes, and um, we had that for nearly two years, and it was quite good, but we sort of outgrew the system, and the, the volume of material going into it was... Um, we, we outgrew its capacity. So we had to think in terms of whether we got uh, employed another person just to, to deal with accounts or to use a machine. John chose to use a machine. But the sort of system needed to run a small veterinary practice is not the sort of thing you pick up at your nearest dealer. It was uh, September last year uh, at the British Veterinary Association Congress that um, I, I really started looking and it stemmed from then and it took something like uh, six months to decide on the right system. There's two sources, the, the, the systems designed by veterinary surgeons and already in use in practices and there were the systems from just computer uh, dealers who thought that they could write programs uh, to fit what we wanted. It worried me that there would be problems uh, if they wrote it from scratch. Hello. But uh, perhaps they would not think of things that we would want. So I decided in the end to go for a system that was already operating in a practice and, if you like, designed by a veterinary surgeon. I dealt with a, a firm, a small firm, uh, run by a veterinary surgeon who is in practice in Edinburgh. Um, I chose him because I thought this was the best system f at the moment on the market and would suit our needs uh, best. I was slightly worried about the distance and the ability to service um, the equipment from such a long way away. Can I have your name, please? My name's Fannin. 
Eventually, John made his choice, and the system has been installed and running for six months now. It's a multi-user system based on a North Star Horizon. Not the newest of machines, but it's the software that counts. Ah. Oh. And the dog's name? Chloe. In fact, we have two dogs here today for their yearly injections. You'll have to put them on separately, so you have to... The system supports a database of client records, which are updated and added to all the time. Imagine how old is Chloe? Chloe's three years old. Right, so on either side. Not used to such attention. Indeed. <laughs> Undoubtedly, the system makes a good impression on the clients. They like coming to a practice with a modern image. The advantage to the practice is that all the client records are readily available and the vets can see a complete case history at a glance. Come on, Tim, sit down. Before the computer was introduced, the vets occasionally made a mistake about the price of the consultation or the price of the medicines. Very good boy. Oh, there we go. There's a good boy. There we are. Hold on. Okay, that's it. Hold on. Thanks very much. The system now costs everything automatically. And for this reason alone, it could well pay for itself in just two years and the problems of invoicing should disappear as well. Everybody in the practice is pleased with how successful the computer has been in making their jobs easier, which proves the value of going to see an identical working system before buying one yourself. John Drew had help from his professional association, but many people don't. In those circumstances, they have to go straight to a consultant. Now, Mac, you've been in the computer industry for 20 years or more. Is consultancy a dirty word? Well, the problem is that anybody can call themselves a consultant. It's not like a medical consultant where you have to be qualified. They're more like estate agents or motor car dealers, and they're to be trusted at about the same level. Their advice can be very, very variable and sometimes extremely expensive. The other thing is they might pretend to be independent when really they're not. They might be getting a kickback from the software they're selling or their hardware. So it's not really sometimes independent advice that you're getting. Right. What sort of services would a consultant offer, in fact? Well, the first thing you'd expect is for him to be able to tell you what the benefits there are to your company to installing a computer system. What really tangible benefits are you going to make more money? You don't expect him to recommend some software, maybe package software. Now, that may need to be tailored to your exact requirements. He may also recommend that you actually have a handcrafted program written for you, but that tends to be expensive and the maintenance is a real problem. But above all, I think he should be responsible or take the responsibility for actually implementing and install the system and see it right through until you're satisfied with it. Now, of course, good advice can save you thousands of pounds, but how do you know that you're talking to a real expert? Well, I think you have to use your own judgment here. There are lots of people who pretend to be computer experts, but what you're looking for is a guy who's an expert in your business, and you can judge that. Now, how do you tell whether he's a good computer expert? Well, the simple test, as we saw in that piece of film there, is to ask him to look at one of the systems or several of the systems that he's already installed, preferably in your type of business, and then you can see whether he's got some satisfied customers. What about the cost? Well, they can be quite expensive. You can get down to £60 for one hour, £250 a day is probably the minimum, but for very specialised work, of course, it may amount to even more than £1,000 a day. But sometimes you can get a fixed price for implementing a particular system, particularly if the, customer, if the uh, consultant really understands what he's doing in your particular business. That's very expensive. Well, would you expect to get some sort of guarantee with that? Oh, yes. You'd expect to have a, an acceptance period, perhaps of a month or so, and then a 90-day warranty, so he'd fix up any bugs or problems that arose in that. But sometimes that's not enough. I came across one particular example where this company installed a system, it was working very satisfactorily, and then they installed their 1501th customer. They typed it in, didn't say anything, but it was overwriting the disk as it was going through. So the more customers they added, the more it was corroding their disk until eventually the whole system collapsed. Now what happened then is the customer said to the consultant, look, it's your fault. The, customer, the consultant says, no, no, it's yours. You should have taken a backup. And not only that, you know, you should have told us that you were, only, there was, that you were going to have 1,500 customers. The customer said, no, no, it's your fault. You never told us there was a limit of 1,500. Right, so that lands them straight into the legalities of the situation. Well, David Tench of the Consumers Association is an expert on consumer law. David, would you expect to have the right of redress in a situation like that? I think you can expect to have it. If you take the example that Mac has just described, um, the, the uh, person who's having the, the system recommended relies on the consultant. 
and it should be absolutely clear, if necessary in writing, that the customer is relying on the expert and the expert ought to anticipate the needs of the customer, the eccentricities of the customer, and using his experience, a lifetime's experience, uh, get the system to suit the customer, anticipating all the things that might go wrong. A thing like capacity. Uh, he should know, for example, that customers often uh, underestimate the capacity because they don't uh, foresee what might happen as the business expands. All that kind of thing is what the customer relies on the expert to anticipate and to tailor the system to take that into account and then to make provision for it and for the things that might go wrong to build into the system uh, fail-safe mechanisms which will take account of or at least warn uh, the customer when the system has reached capacity and that something uh, needs to be done to take account of it. Right, now the consultant is the expert. Does that mean that the customer has got to spell out how naive he is? Well, in a way, legally, the, the more naive he appears, the better. Uh, because if the customer uh, starts boasting, using the jargon, going, I know what I need, then that tends to shade down the responsibility that the expert takes. So the more naive the customer appears, the better. And the customer should make it quite clear to the, uh, to the consultant that he is relying on the co consultant's expertise to get the system right. If that is made clear, especially if it's, it's underlined in writing, then uh, if something does go wrong, the, the chances of redress are much, much better. Assume something does go wrong and uh, assume you can establish that it's, the, it's the, the expert's responsibility. What sort of damages could you expect in a situation like that? Well, the law makes good provision for that. Under the law of dealing with professional negligence or breach of contract, whichever it is, uh, the responsibility is for the expert to compensate the customer for the full cost uh, uh, that he ought to anticipate would flow from the failure to do the job correctly. It could have been bankruptcy in the case we heard. Well, it could well be. And uh, uh, it's quite important for the customer, when he's outlining his needs, to think through what might be the financial consequences if the system crashed or if something serious went wrong and to tell the consultant, look, you do realize that my business will depend on this, that the cash flow consequences might be that, and so on. And if it's brought home to the expert in advance what the consequences would be, then if the worst does happen, that is, all those items would be roped into the, the compensation that the expert would have to pay. And it could amount to a very huge sum of money indeed. Now, to avoid all that, how can you protect yourself? Very briefly, how could you protect yourself at the outset? Well, the important thing is to get the understandings clear and in writing. When the expert leaves after a first visit, write him a letter saying, to confirm what we discussed and set out the understanding. So it's on the record that the responsibility is there. With him. Thank you, David Tench, very much. Mac, a final word. Well, don't be bluffed into believing that some so-called computer expert knows how to install a computer in your business if he knows nothing about your business. It's very dangerous.